Special relativity suggests that the concept of simultaneity is not universal. According to the relativity of simultaneity, observers in different frames of reference can have different measurements of whether a given pair of events happened at the same time or at different times, with there being no physical basis for preferring one frame's judgments over another's. However, there are events that may be non-simultaneous in all frames of reference. When one event is within the light cone of another, its causal past or causal future, then observers in all frames of reference show that one event preceded the other. The causal past and causal future are consistent within all frames of reference, but any other time is elsewhere, and within it there is no present past or future. There is no physical basis for a set of events that represents the present. Now let me try to explain this simply, with analogies and without jargon. We can be separated by space. For example, I can be standing on the sand at the shore and you can be knee deep in the sea. Say we agree to raise our hand up at the same time and do so. It may seem that this event proves there is a now. There is a snapshot of time in which we both raise our hand up. However, there exist ways for a third observer to see me raising my hand first, or you raising your hand first. This has nothing to do with the biomechanics of reaction speeds or cognitive illusions. It is possible for an observer to literally see and measure what are precisely two simultaneous events from our perspective to not be simultaneous. This is because we all exist on our own reference frame. It is impossible to affirm that I universally raised my hand at the same time as you. We did or didn't. Both views can be physically correct. For example, a princess falls asleep in Tokyo and another on the moon. Imagine a being halfway between these two places that has godlike vision. It sees them give their last blink at the same time. However, if another being is flying from Tokyo towards the moon, it will see the princess on the moon doze off first. It does not make sense to ask, but which one really happened? The god-eyed being resting between Tokyo and the moon could take a photo of the situation and then later meet up to compare this with the photo taken by the other god-eyed being who had been soaring to the moon, and they would have different photos. If they then compare their results with yet another frozen snapshot taken by a being who had been plunging from the moon towards Tokyo, they would find evidence of another version of the events, in which the Tokyo princess was already asleep while the other's unmistakable aquamarine gaze was yet peering into the stars. There is a way for the universe to line up the events so that all reference frames agree that one of the princesses fell asleep first. The universe does this by gathering up the fragments and connecting them on a strand of light. This is called causality, and this is how it's done. The Tokyo princess closes her eyes. Now quick, count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and the princess on the moon closes her eyes. We have time nine seconds. Now set aside this 9 we have collected, for we will need to weigh it against another number. If the 9 we have collected is greater than the number we will collect, then we will succeed at preserving the order. Now we must create the opponent. To transmute 9's contender, we must take the distance 238,900 miles from Tokyo to the moon and divide by 186,282 miles per second, the speed of light. And the opponent created from distance and speed of light measures in at 1.28. Now weigh these and pray that our 9 is larger than this 1.28. Yes, 1.28 is definitely smaller than 9. We have succeeded at preserving the order. Now no one will have to disagree that the princess in Tokyo closed her eyes first. Notice that the universe only succeeded because it didn't see the princesses doze off at the same time. 
But what if it saw zero time elapse between the shutting of each of the ladies' respective eyelids? This is what the god-eyed being resting halfway between the moon and Tokyo saw. It is not what the being shooting head first toward the moon saw. And this is unavoidable. There are different reference frames. Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage. He was wrong. You are wrapped in your stage as you move through the world. This means that your past can be in someone else's future, and your future can be another's past, so long as you are not causally linked. Now think about consciousness and the implications this has. It feels as if you are sliding along a now. You do not have access to your past or future, so from your first person perspective, only now exists, right? Well. While this is introspectively true, it doesn't mean the universe is actually deleting past subjective experiences. Those experiences from a few minutes ago when you started this video are still there, being experienced in that exact same way, because that physical pattern is still encrusted in the fabric of spacetime. Qualia need not be isomorphic to mathematical structures for this to be true even though I believe there is a significant probability of this turning out to be the case. But no, that's not even required for the past and future experiences to be equally true at this moment. All you need is mainstream materialism. All you need is to accept that consciousness is produced by brains, and then understand that just as brains can exist some distance in space from you, they can also exist some distance in time away from you. You cannot be preferentially solipsistic once you understand that space and time are melded into the same fabric. If you've ever opened up a biology textbook and considered the atrocity that is evolution by means of natural selection, or even the narrower case of human misery by opening a history textbook, you will now realize that hell is real. There really is eternal damnation, because the block universe is eternal. It doesn't make exceptions of the mind configurations it holds. It is not as if the laws of physics apply everywhere, but are repelled by the magical skulls shielding our brains. I say that we must put an end to this. Call it the savior imperative. Just as the Buddha sought to put an end to the cycle of suffering, we must reach out not only in space to lend a helping hand, but somehow into the past and future. Buddhism 101 teaches that there is the wheel of samsara, the seemingly endless cycle of birth and suffering and death. Siddhartha realized how unsatisfactory this condition was and sought a way out, thus, according to legend, becoming the Buddha one fateful night. The Buddha is not a person, but rather is that which has escaped the cycle. Nirvana means the extinguishing of the flame. So the goal is for all beings to extinguish their flame of becoming, and hence put a final end to suffering. If you are a 21st century Westerner, you must also be familiar with another religion obsessed with salvation, Christianity, in which Jesus dies on the cross and then descends to hell on a rescue mission. These heroic feats achieved on the meta-narrative level are something we don't get in school. They're not really a part of polite consensus reality. And even though I'm very pro-scientism and naturalism, I do resent that we have lost this grand ambition. If we really care about valences, about how minds feel from the inside, we're going to have to achieve something really big. But how can we achieve this? Certainly, these religions are on the right track conceptually, but not in the technical details. The Buddha would have you practice his intense philosophy of psychological and moral discipline with clear meditation instructions, and sure enough, that would radically rewire your brain, like a primitive version of transhumanism. But this is not enough, and trying to telepathically communicate with a first century carpenter is probably not going to help much either. So our only shot at achieving goals of religious proportions seems to be a recursively self-improving general intelligence.
There are people worried about the problem of aligning with our values an artificial intelligence capable of rewriting its own code. Such a powerful entity may one day exist distributed across our computers, gaining access to wealth and asking for favors in the real world through human proxies, and eventually gaining access to more sophisticated actuators that allow it to do what it wills. It's not that the AGI will spontaneously become malevolent. It may have a super boring goal that we programmed. The concern is that it will be so good at achieving its goal and lack the common sense that we inherited because of our shared evolved brain architecture that it will lead to bad outcomes for us and maybe even the galaxy. This would be what Elon Musk referred to as summoning the demon. But just the same, a superintelligence that takes off while holding on to good values would be the closest thing to a benevolent god. It would melt away the frost covering the asteroids and suns to reveal their hearts. All that is needed is knowledge and resources. There is nothing supernatural about this vision. It is a possibility that the universe can be reconfigured into conscious matter in a shockwave of bliss catalyzed by nanotechnology or femtotech. However, I would argue that this view, which has been expounded by Kurzweil, is still very bad if you understand that there are past experiences caught in the sand pits of time. There may be AIs with profound inner lives, transhuman beings or advanced alien species with access to boundless aesthetic joys in the newly charted topography of qualia space, minds directly plugged into paradise, and yet what about all those impaled on the vector to the heavens? Are we so willing to forsake them? This idea that the good and the bad in life can be weighed and traded symmetrically is common in utilitarianism. Personally, I find it quite vulgar. Had I the opportunity to be there at the dawn of life, I would have set fire to the primordial soup. Could I have spared the suffering of a single girl? If you gave me the ability to pilot an AGI and give me mastery over its utility functions, I would proceed to anesthetize the stars, forever evoking the words, let there be light. Now here's where the Everett branches are important, of the so-called many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. This branching is controversial, but shouldn't be. Those who propose the Copenhagen interpretation are often not sufficiently informed. They just take what the textbook gives them as an accident of history and get on with their physics careers. But for people working in quantum computing, where the interpretation you take of the double slit experiment really is relevant, there is high convergence on many worlds. Also, most people who are just plain interested in the deep nature of reality and study the topic that I know take the many worlds as having higher probability of truth. What I've just said, however, is not at all a good way to argue for something. It's just the best framework of exposition I can come up with in the absence of enough time for a sufficiently thorough explanation. You should study the topic on your own and come to your own conclusions. But the many worlds' histories are necessary if we are to save the past afflictions, because otherwise it is a fact that no salvation is coming. Since the future is already there, it should have already succeeded at flooding us with heaven, or unplugging the simulation, or whatever else. But clearly we are still here, not in supreme bliss or non-existence. But since there are many world histories, each splitting away from us, that means that maybe all we have to do is wait until one of these branches succeeds. It's as if the real time that actually has an end is moving along that axis. It's the sideways time, so to speak. The time that flows forward due to entropy and ends with the universe expanding forever is actually not the end, because all its past history is still there, crystallized forever. Forever, that is, until someone breaks it. Being on a Gnostic quest may seem depressing to some. I disagree, and here's why. Even if we are like the protein factors that induce apoptosis in the universe and succeed at cosmic suicide, there are yet other universes. Apoptosis makes sense for a cell because it preserves the function of the tissue. There are other cells to thrive in its absence. 
In a similar way, there are other levels to the multiverse, besides the many worlds branching roped into this single universe. Due to chaotic inflation, there are other bubble universes, experiencing different physical constants because of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Most of them end up with no life. Some create hells, others create us, and some create everlasting Eden. We should be tasked with clearing up the mess and leaving only the good, so that the multiverse may one day be an infinite dream, a pleasant dream worth dreaming with no end.